So yeah, let's, let's dive into it. Uh, so what I'm working on in Red Hat is a thing called Connected Custom Experience, where in a nutshell we are collecting the health data from the OpenShift clusters for our customers, if they are okay with that. We do or try to do some magic and then provide the profit in terms of better user experience for the customers. It might be you know, services they, they can use based on this data. It might be improving the product based on the analytics and so on. So we basically are focusing on the phase two of, of this strategy and so I'm spending most of my time. And in detail, what I do is I see probability clusters, uh, and by clusters I mean OpenShift instances. Because if the OpenShift instance is happy, I don't see it. Like it's boring. Right? We are interested in the stuff or in the clusters that have some problems. So basically, we are looking at the problematic clusters and trying to reason about that. And the rest of this presentation will be tightly coupled with this. I'm not data scientist. I'm I'm not data scientist uh, by training, uh, but I do data science by accident, maybe, or by necessity. Like uh, because without that, you can't can't do much in, in, in this business. So uh, that's like I have interesting relation with, with, uh, with the data science. Like it's love hate the relationship. I would say I love doing that. Data science doesn't love me always, <laughs> but we are very doing well. One of the problems of the OpenShift when it comes to looking at the, the problems or understanding problems is the un underlying Prometheus telemetry and alerting and the distributed notion of the Kubernetes where each component has basically their own definitions of what, what's the problem. And the problem is when there is some central issue, some root cause in the cluster, multiple components start complaining about that. So what you end up having is you know, some timeline where you have multiple alerts triggering at the same time. So there are you know, maybe 20 different alerts that we've seen uh, around 9 a.m., but there were not 20 problems that the cluster has seen. Right? Like it might be one, two, maybe at most three, but the problems are different than the signal that we are having. So the question is, can we do something to reason better and show closer the root cause of that, which I believe I described in, in, in this next slide, basically. We try to view these alerts, these signals that we have about the cluster into some related things and ideally also be able to reason about the uh, cause and the consequence of, of these problems. And that's, you know, this, that's why this talk is about correlation and causation because it's, it's tightly coupled uh, with, with this particular problem. So we now uh, will move away a bit from the OpenShift itself and I will talk about this uh, problem in, in more broader terms. So one thing when it comes to the grouping, many times you start thinking about maybe clustering and people that have tried or seen some machine learning thing, that's the first thing that they suggest. You know, like, of course, it's clustering algorithms, you know, just, just do that. And the question is really, should I do this path, go this path, or should I not? Uh, that's, that's the question. So we tried that. Uh, we tried some clustering algorithms, so we did our embeddings thing, we did uh, principal component analysis, we did uh, dimensional reduction, we did clustering algorithms of all sorts, and it kind of works. One of the problems that we had there is that once, you know, these are basically different symptoms that if they are close together somehow mean that they were related or happening at the same time. The problem with this approach is it's hard to interpret this. Like it, you can kind of feel that they are probably related, but there is some limitations of reasoning about it. That's why in, in machine learning, often it's mentioned that there is problem with explainability. That's one of the reasons. Like it does something, but you really can't tell much how it does. So we can also try a different approach, and that's that's what this talk will be about mostly. So. No, we, we have this all this fancy machine learning, deep learning, artificial intelligence stuff, you know, in, in the state that they have axios, but there is still this thing called statistics that has been around for some time, and I don't think we should forget about that. So we'll be taking a bit more statistical approach on trying to find these relations. And I believe that's the end of my slides. And now I will switch to this different. Tab, 
And that's how you know that there is some data science going on, because all of a the sudden there is a Jupyter notebook. Right? Like mm -hmm. There are some big Jupyter notebooks. You can be sure that there, there is some data science going on. There might be some other things going on in Jupyter notebook, but we have also data. So there is some, something with data. And in the next, uh, next cell, we also have some latex equations. So that's science, right? So the data, we have science. So we are doing data science. Uh, before we jump to, to some data, I prepared a small magic trick. I never, ne never trained that, so it might not work at all. So I have here, I have my kids with, uh, for some toys that I have, have in this bag, and I have a special capability which is called chromatic ear, which means that I can hear the color. Right. So let's try. I, I've never tried that. I just I have a feeling that I, I know that I know how to do it. So I, I randomly choose the, some item and, and play silence. There's some voice. Okay. 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 I think I think it's red. It's red, right? I haven't looked at it. I just saw. I just heard that. So. <laughs> so how did I do that? You can only read objects in the back. <laughs> oh, I forgot to show you. Oh, okay. I have different colors. Different shapes, you know, right? I, I'm, I'm doing it you know, the first time I'm doing this, so, so uh, yeah, I'm doing making mistakes. Of course, there's a trick, and you know, it's it's a really silly one. Yeah. So. If, so it's that the cube is the only one yes, that's right. Yes, of course. Like there's, you can't find no other, other cube with the other color, right? So, but you would not be able to do this trick if I gave you this bag, because you, have, you would have no uh, information about like, you know, the, the statistics and, and probabilities and all things. So that's what differentiates me about you know, being able to do this kind of thing. And now, like, uh, it helps. You know, it's a nice segue to something called Bayesian uh, probabilities of Bayesian theory, where this is all about uh, all of these things. So, if I, I talk uh, and, and I have some uh, uh, marking here, we are talk, talking about this a lot. Like, this notion is probability of one thing while other thing is true. So, in this particular case, uh, what's the probability of of object being red when the object is cube? It's one, like 100%. Like yeah. But we can also do it the other way around. If I have ob red objects, and what's the probability of it being a cube? So I have three cubes, one sphere. So it's three quarters, the probability. So it's some one kind of misleading thing about Bayesian theory is that probability of one versus the other, like, is different when you switch the, the directions. And that's like, I will maybe sometimes still use this as the, the visual representation of that, because it makes it, makes it easier. So we're not talking about objects and colors. We'll be talking about symptoms. I, I mentioned the health data on the OpenShift. And that's basically you know, some property that you have or don't have, which we call a symptom. And I will not talk about OpenShift alerts per se, because doesn't tell you much, but I will talk about something closer to humans, which is the you know, human diseases. I'm sorry about the topic. I, I was not able to figure out anything more positive. <laughs> not that you know, being tested positive. Uh, anyway, so we have some patients here. Uh, data set that I just created for this occasion, where how to interpret this is that I have, for example, 10 patients that are uh, or have positive flu test and have this set of symptoms, fever, cough, headache, you know. Uh, we have also some lucky patients that have flu, but no symptoms. We just, you know, happen to, to test them positively, but they are completely fine spreading the thing around. You know. uh, we also have some, uh, I think I included some unfortunate uh, person that had chickenpox and all, you know, these chickenpox symptoms but he also break, broken uh, his leg, so double, double uh, 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 unlucky there. But 
I included there just to I'm sure that we, we could have multiple reasons for the symptoms at the same patient. And we want to be able to spread that. So in here, like we can re reason about you know, the consequences of flu and fever. And how it relates to the open shift is that in the open shift world, when you have just a stream of alerts, you don't have any metadata saying DNS is down, you can expect you know, something, some component or some, some container being broken. We don't have this metadata. And the task is can we find these relations based on the statistic data that we have? But back again to our data set with, the, with our patients. So, uh, how we can find some uh, or start reasoning about the relations between different symptoms? Uh, so, we'll be using this Bayesian theory here where we'll be looking at the probability of one thing while the other thing uh, is happening. So, in the first thing, we'll calculate the probability of having the fever when you have a flu, right? So it's, it's probably not that surprising that if you have the flu, there's high chance that you have fever uh, uh, in, in that occasion. So when we are running that in our data set, basically we need just the number of, uh, number of patients that have both fever and flu. That's basically in, in this, it's the number of red uh, cubes, yeah, red cubes. And the flu, all the patients that are flu, that, that is the, the red thing. So we have uh, red as a flu, and a subset of that is the fever and flu. So the, it's red and it's cube, so it's the, it's the denominator, and the denominator is the, the whole set of objects, so this, in this case, patients with flu. So it's, it's nothing else than just looking at number of patients with fever in a set of uh, patients with flu. And we get about 60% based on this synthetic uh, data set. So it seems that it's kind of related, but we can't tell for sure yet. Why is that? We don't know what's the probability of fever in the whole population. Like in this case, it would be probably intuitive to say that you know, probably only a few percent of the population has fever, but if the fever was set with threshold 36 degrees, I would not tell you Fahrenheit, I'm sorry, uh, then basically everyone would, would have it and it would be uh, useless for our analysis. So it's still good to calculate the probability of the, of the fever itself, and then we can compare these values. So what we did here, is something that's called likelihood ratio. And at the top one, we have still have the probability of fever when you have flu, it's this 60%. And we compare it to the probability of having fever in the whole population. And we get some number which, if it's higher than one, there is some, some uh, sign that it's significant, there is some relation, there is some correlation. Uh, so the higher, the, e, uh, the higher the number there is, the more these things are correlated, right? So that's so good. What I mentioned there is that in the OpenShift world, we don't really have the information about the relations, like what's causing what. We have just, you know, symbols of, of individual components. So is there some way to set this direction? Like, you know, compare it maybe. What, what, what if we switch the order, right? So if we look right now about what's the probability of fever when you have flu and then compare the population. We can also try to switch it around. So taking the probability of flu while you have a fever. Just, just for the fun. So again, like nothing new, it's really almost the same as the first one. We just really switch the order, or basically we just switch the denominator. And we have you no know, different numbers, so the results are different as well. There's still you know, higher probability of uh, having flu while you have fever, like nothing uh, surprising about that. And we can also calculate this or compare that to the whole population uh, probability of the flu, which is this ratio. So we have different numbers here. Uh, 0.6 slash 0.23, and now we have 0.47 slash 0.18. Okay. 
Now the question is like what's the, the result value of that? So I recover that. And it's it's almost the same number, it, it's not the same number just because I was rounding the numbers while doing this so that it doesn't produce too much output, but basically these two values are the same. So we took different directions, we look at the flu versus fever and fever versus flu. We even had different ratios, but then when we calculate that we ended up with the same number, which for me was surprising. Then I will get Bayesian theory and all this and how it works and it has to be this way. So the conclusion is that this is symmetric, uh, these, are, these numbers are symmetric and doesn't give us any indication of the causality, just for, for this reason. So when people say correlations of causation, one of the reasons for that is many times when you calculate these correlations, they are symmetric, so you can't tell much more about, uh, you can't reason much more about it. So, uh, sorry, just mm -hmm. so I understand it correctly. Um, is that an artifact, the, the fact that the numbers are the same, is that because, is that always going to be the true when you switch them, or is that because of the way that this data happens to be, and that's how it's it always the way. Always the way. You, right. you, you, can not, yeah. you, you can improve it just with, with the base on theory yeah, and everything yeah. else. Okay, thank uh, you. I, I, I don't have enough time to do that, but it, it's fun, for sure. So, it will not work for us for, for the reason. But we can compare different things. And I will repeat, like what we, we, we compared before is having flu while fever compared to having flu without any other conditions. We can also uh, formulate it differently or use different comparison mechanism, which is uh, probably I have flu while I have fever compared to I have flu while I don't have fever. There's a difference. I don't compare it to, to all the uh, feverness or flu fluidness. I compare it to the flu while I don't, don't have the fever, which is something that I've learned later. It's called relative risk. Because first I just was uh, making up some, some terms. So if you search for it, it's relative risk. So probability of flu while I have fever versus probability of flu while I don't have fever. So We'll calculate that. So this is flu while I have no fever. Again, no uh, really surprise that it's not that high number because there are many patients uh, with other symptoms that is neither uh, flu no fever. So probability of having flu without no fever means you need to have other disease, and they are not so common. So we ended up with. Uh, 0.9 program. And we can do the same the other way around. Uh, no, we, we still uh, we, we compare the original probability, I had a flu with fever, compared to flu and no fever, and we ended up with a different number. So basically this is the equivalent of our first equation in here, where we, we were comparing well, two probabilities. Now we have just a different different coefficient. So it's uh, so we have flu versus uh, fever and non-fever, and now we can do the same for fever versus flu. Again, I have different ratio ratios there. The question is, will be will they be the same? And if they would, I would probably not give them this presentation, right? <laughs> so they are different. Now we see that flu compared to fever has five, and fever compared to flu has four. So, okay, uh, it, you know, it tells us something. So, this is basically where our static thinking can be used this to actually indicate the causality of, of, of the problem. So, that's, that's the pretty much about theory, and the assumption is that the higher the score, the closer the, the symptom that it's at the first place there is causing the whole thing. So I prepared also a function that is calculating these values in tables so that you have all these numbers in one place and we see that flu has higher uh, relative risk than the fever compared to flu. So we would indicate that flu is causing the fever. Also I can, I can show this 
for the likelihood uh, ratio, basically the, the uh, you've seen this 2.58 uh, number, uh, it's, it's this one. So basically we can compare and you can see really here that uh, it's symmetrical. So you can't tell much about this. So how this actually works? So you know, it's nice to have some synthetic, uh, synthetic data set and it just <coughs> worked. So but we want to understand how, how it works. So I have here a simplified data set where I have still patients. I have 10 patients with flu and fever. I have 10 patients with flu and nothing else. I have 10 patients with fever and nothing else. And I have no other patients. So would that work in this case? And it doesn't. Because it can't, and, and why it doesn't is that we even have lower relative risk when it comes to flu and fever and fever and flu. Right? Just because the symptoms are called this way, but, but the data are not really real, it just will not give us the correct answers. So one thing that this approach really needs is quite good data. And first of all, you need some other examples, some negative examples that don't match neither flu or fever. So I will include some patients that don't have these symptoms. And now we start to see some correlation between the flu and fever. Because otherwise it can't reason about the probabilities because it doesn't know about anything about how common fever or flu is. Uh, and the other thing that we also need is some disbalance. So right now like it's still showing uh, similar correlations because we have 10 patients with flu and fever and 10 patients with flu and uh, nothing at all, so it can't reason much. So, but we can increase the number of patients with flu and fever, and we can also include other reasons for the fever other than flu. 50. And now it starts showing up. Like now we see that flu uh, relative ratio to fever is much hi higher than fever versus flu. So there is like you need other reasons for for the fever to be in the data set to start you know, being able to reason about this. It's not that different from how you know, all these fancy lang large language model work. They need a lot of data, a lot of examples to be able to deduce the, you know, the probabilities. Like, it's much more simplified in this way, but you still need data. And on the other hand, you can also use this as a test to set, tell whether the data you have are really uh, uh, useful or not. You can, you can just have garbage in, your garbage out, like you can't do much about that. So that's some experimentation with the data. And now, can we do it for the whole data set? Yeah, you know, I was comparing just the flu and the fever, but I was, you know, I had the chicken pox, I had the bro broken legs. I want to uh, see the holistic picture. So I have prepared this table, so you can see the relations, right? It's, it's clear. <laughs> Oh, 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 you are a data scientist. <laughs> so let's do something. <coughs> so this is basically the graph representation of, of that. Basically, we ignored the low uh, relative risks. We just don't put line between headache and a broken leg because the relative risk was just below one or below threshold. And we include the, the lines between them. And you already see some components in this graph. Uh, and you can apply some graph theory there where rash, you can box and fever could be considered as one common thing, basically all things are related. In graph theory I learned that it's called click or something like that, that you can search for these com components. Similar fever, flu, cough, sore throat, even he headache is somehow related and it's, it's going to be tiredness. We have uh, we, on the broken uh, legs and bones part, we have you know, this whole component that is related to pain, because I said the data set to be this way. So, but I was talking about the, the causality. You see no no arrows there, so I was still uh, ignoring that part. But we can also draw the arrow, sorry, uh, draw the, the arrows there pointing the right, right there, the direction. And now we have the directions. When the direction means like we think one is cause of the other, so the, the symptom is pointing to the uh, to the cause, and you can see the chicken box and flu here are are the only balls that are points that have already incoming arrows. So everyone comes points to those directions, which is, in my opinion, 
cup of magic. <laughs> so I'm not saying it's perfect. It still relies on you know, how quality data you have and all, all these other things. Things are not that simple. This thing can't do you know, com combining multiple symptoms and how they uh, differentiate things. But there are some properties of it that are also uh, much, much nicer, such as it doesn't require any GPUs. No GP was hurt. <laughs> uh, you, and you can still run it on GPU if you can't wait for five minutes and you want to have it in one minute or so. Uh, but uh, it's much easier to do. You can also, uh, if you compare it to, to the machine learning algorithms, it has uh, some benefits as it, you can really reason about it. You, it's still some numbers that you can put some meaning behind. Uh, and you can iterate fast and does it understand how good you, uh, you have or your data have. I mentioned the common cognitive power. So the conclusion I would say for, for that is that you, know, you should be using both. <laughs> Don't be shy to use both. Don't be shy to use stats just because machine learning is cool. But I notice that the boring guy is proposing machine learning and uh, the cool guy is proposing stats. Uh, so that's, that's pretty much uh, what I wanted to, uh, the message I wanted to give here. And the last thing, just if you hear data science, don't think about that as a job for the data scientists because I've seen that it's very level for subject matter experts to do these kind of things and complement this whole area with you know, some, some knowledge about the field itself and we really don't need to uh, be rocket scientists to do this kind of thing. You can look at me as, as an example of that. So with that, I guess we are running almost out of time. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. And I will still have maybe three minutes for questions. So now is the time to do that. So questions? Do you want to have more tricks? <laughs> because if you do, I can't help you. Okay, so oh, there's some question. Like, what are some real um, examples where you you were able to use this and like solve get to root cause analysis? Were you able to like? Great are you question. Able to show some examples? Great question. And actually, we we have a, uh, we were not planning this, but I have some real example here. It's not about the, the root cause. Like, I, it's still something that I need to apply to the real world, uh, and we've seen uh, some of these indications. But when it comes to the clustering, like grouping the things together, this is some real data where we have some cluster where it has some issue here, which you can see had multiple different alerts. We don't really want to uh, reason much about that. We can do some time grouping, which is just grouping the things together based on the time that appeared, they started happening. But then we can apply you know, this uh, additional contextual grouping. And I will highlight this, this particular group. Uh, and I will also do this thing. So when we did the time grouping, we had these at CD members down and Brazilian other alerts, but there was some some noise introduced there because some other incident was just happening at the same time. When I include the additional contextual grouping, it's now split into two things. So we still have the uh, the at CD members down, but then we have the pod security violation that really was not related. And just you know, for the statistics that we had about that, we could actually separate those two. So that's, you know, that's basically the area area of applying this kind of approach for, for the real world, not just for playing around in Jupyter Thank you for the question. <laughs>